today. I will be the greatest representative of the Christians that they've had in a long time. A new day in Washington, and Christians are coming out of the shadows. Plus, how to spice up your love life, courtesy of relationship expert, Kevin Lehman. And then, the former heavyweight champion of the world, WWE legend Shawn Michaels, joins us live on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Donald Trump is meeting with the media today, his first press conference since winning the White House. And two of the hottest topics, his relations with Russia and the confirmation hearings for his cabinet choices. Trump's choice for Sec Secretary of State goes before the Senate today, and Democrats are also taking on his Attorney General nominee, Jeff Sessions. George Thomas has the story. Rex Tillerson, tapped to be Donald Trump's Secretary of State, is expected to face a contentious confirmation hearing. Lawmakers plan to grill the former Exxon CEO about connections to Russian leader Vladimir Putin, as well as his numerous global business ties. Despite the political theatrics, most expect him to be confirmed as America's next top diplomat. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee... And Trump's attorney general nominee, Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions, is back for another round today after facing hours of questioning on a wide range of issues, from national security, same-sex marriage, abortion rights, to a ban on Muslims coming to America. Would you support a law that says you can't come to America because you're a Muslim? No. While vowing to protect law and order, Sessions also spent time defending his record and denying allegations of racial animosity, accusations that derailed his federal judicial nomination 30 years ago. I am the same person, uh, perhaps wiser and maybe a little better, I hope so, today than I was then, but I did not harbor the kind of animosities and race based discrimination ideas that were uh, I was accused of. I did not. More confirmation hearings are scheduled throughout the week. And two months after winning the presidency, Donald Trump holds his first press conference today. He's expected to face questions about an unverified report with allegations that Russia has compromising personal and financial information on him that could be damaging. Trump responded in all caps on Twitter, blasting the unsubstantiated report as fake news, a total political witch hunt. The Kremlin also chimed in, calling the allegations pulp fiction. The story broke just hours before President Obama took the stage in Chicago for his farewell speech. Tonight it's my turn to say thanks. Whether we have seen eye to eye, or rarely agreed at all. My conversations with you, the American people, in living rooms and in schools, at farms, on factory floors, at diners, and on distant military outposts, those conversations are what have kept me honest, and kept me inspired, and kept me going. And every day I have learned from you. You made me a better president. And you made me a better man. But the man set to take over from him has vowed to undo many of his signature policies, including Obamacare. Trump telling Congress to repeal and replace the law immediately. In addition to focusing on Obamacare, there are signs the Trump economic plan could have positive results. The World Bank says Trump's tax cuts could jumpstart the U.S. economy and growth around the world. And it appears America's small business owners can't wait either. A survey shows optimism surging by the most since 1980. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. On that speech of uh, Obama, he mentioned himself, I think, 75 times. His speech was longer than the combined speeches, farewell, of Ronald Reagan, of uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, George Bush. You are kidding. Actually, I'm not that surprised. He <laughs> yeah. did do a lot of patting himself on the back. 75 times. Seeing how, what a great guy he is. And uh, uh, I tell you, when you look, the economy is in shambles. The growth is the historic low. Uh, businesses uh, are failing, and uh, we're struggling. And 
you can see what's happening in the stock market and the um, whole optimism of the especially small business of, of uh, owners. Uh, it is amazing just the fact that Trump's appearance has uh, lifted the spirits not only of America but the whole world. I mean, that is a, an amazing accomplishment. Well, the man who shot nine black church members has now been given his decision by a federal jury, and that is a very appropriate death sentence. Ephraim Graham has this. Pat, the jury sentenced Dylan Roof to death for killing nine black church members during a Bible study at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. Relatives of the victims believe justice has been served. I'm happy he got a fair trial. I'm also happy that he got the death penalty but we still don't have our family members. When my sister was killed, this community pulled together in a way that I had never seen. Roof acted as his own attorney in the sentencing phase. Speaking to the jury, Roof did not offer apologies, but instead said, quote, I still feel like I had to do it. Jury members deliberated for three hours before returning with a decision. Roof also faces a state trial where he could be sentenced to death again. Christianity is appearing, apparently gaining ground among the next generation in China. Many millennials are looking for answers to life big questions in church. And Christian leaders are hopeful the younger generation could bring their nation closer to God. Caitlin Burke brings us the story. China is getting younger and younger. 24 million people live in Shanghai and three fourths are millennials, adults between the ages of 20 and 33. This age demographic is moving to Shanghai for several reasons. I moved to Shanghai a few years ago. My friends kept telling me I could find better jobs here. I want to earn more money for my family. Besides looking for jobs, millennials have also joined the Christian community. To cope with societal pressure, young people are increasingly turning to support groups and spirituality. One study found that 62% of China's religious believers are between the ages of 19 and 39. One day, my friend invited me to church after work. It was new to me. As I listened to the music, all of a sudden, I felt so peaceful. I felt something special. Christian leaders in Shanghai say young people are seeking out churches because they want a place where they can take a break and express themselves openly. Living in the big city is not easy for them. Many of the young people share with me that they face burden all the time. Some of them just cry to me and ask me to help them. Church leaders use biblical truths to help millennials cope with life. They share their own experiences and tell them about God's grace. For the single people, I understand their concerns. I read the story of Ruth and explained the meaning to them. I wanted to make sure they understood that I had the same struggle before, but God is faithful. Chinese young adults who attend church services regularly say they've learned to pray for themselves and their families, and they no longer feel empty inside. Now I am a Christian. I'm not afraid of anything. Jesus is always with me. I'm not alone when I face difficulties. Shanghai is one of the most important cities in China. Churches are planning to organize more events to reach millennials there, because they believe this young generation could be the only way to bring the city closer to God. We want to use all the resources to build the bridge between young people and our Savior. They could do some amazing work for Jesus. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Amazing to see. God on the move. Pat? Well, I've been there and spoken in those churches, spoken out on the streets, talked to people. I mean, to see the uh, hunger for God in China is overwhelming. And <clears throat> when you go back into the kanjis, the, the uh, pictorial uh, language that is the root of China, uh, it reflects right back to the Old Testament. Uh, time and time again, I mean, I've talked to leaders, including the foreign minister, about those things, and I said, look, here it is. <clears throat> In your language, primitive Christianity is right there. And they go back to it, almost like to Genesis. It is an amazing thing. And the Chinese, I said it before, I'll say it again, is China is going to become the largest Christian nation in the world. And these young people, they, they don't buy into Mao Zedong, the Cultural Revolution, and all that stuff. It's long past history for them. 
and communism really offers them nothing because it has no hope and no, no, nowhere to go. So they, they, they're looking to something to fulfill their, their yearning in their hearts, and they're turning to Jesus, and it is absolutely wonderful. But just keep your eyes on it. And, you know, all this bellicose talk about, well, we're going to fight China and everything. I, the Chinese people, uh, they can't afford a war. They just can't do it. The country doesn't have that kind of money. And <clears throat> they, they need friendship. And, but these young people are the answer. And we should do everything we can to encourage that religious revival in China. Ephraim? Indeed, Pat. Smoking is hitting the world with a high cost to both life and the economy. According to a new report from the World Health Organization and the U.S. National Cancer Institute, about six million people die every year from smoking, and it costs the world more than a trillion dollars a year in health care and loss of productivity. The report also pointed out smoking hits poor countries the hardest. Tobacco use can lead to several deadly diseases, including cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Pat? Well, uh, we ban marijuana, and uh, we ban cocaine, and we ban other types of opiates, but uh, tobacco is the uh, drug that we approve of, and it is deadly. And ladies and gentlemen, I think the time has come for a ban on tobacco. We really need to do it. And what we're doing here in America, we, we're limiting the use of uh, tobacco in America, and we're exporting those things like crazy into third world countries. And the big advertising push is to hook young people on smoking. And in Indonesia, countries like that, it is just disgraceful. And I think uh, the world body, if they'd ever did anything important, it would be to put a ban on tobacco. And as I said, there should be some tax considerations so the tobacco companies can, can have some money to go do something more profitable. Maybe they can get into uh, pharmaceuticals or something, but they cannot any longer be putting this dread disease on the uh, nations uh, of the world. It's just shocking that we're doing it. But this is an export from America that has got to stop. So well, there will be quite the black market for cigarettes yeah. if that happens. Well, <laughs> because I, it's such a strong addiction. I mean, yeah. uh, people that do smoke, I've seen the struggle that they've had. And I'm telling you, it's like there's almost like a resurgence of people smoking lately. 21 days is all it takes. I mean, I, I, I did it. I used to smoke a pack, pack and a half a day. And I, I know what it's like. Years that is and hard years to years. believe. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, were you in, in your 20s? Yeah, I was in law. I was in law school, okay. and, uh, and I, I was a student. And, and I came out of an evidence class. I'd seen some of the pictures about what these things do to you. And I, I did like this. This is the last one I'll ever smoke. I ground it down, and that was the last one I've ever smoked. See, see, my dad was able to do that, but my mom wasn't. So I don't know. Maybe it's easier for some it, people. Twenty-one days. You know, today I'm not going to smoke a cigarette. You know, not today I'm not going to smoke. A so twenty-one days, and all of a sudden, what happens? <clears throat> it it used to be, you know, you really liked them, and then after twenty-one days, it is revolting yeah. to go into a bar with a whole bunch of cigarettes and you know butts in, a, in an ashtray. It is revolting. So your your body actually. Tr yeah. <laughs> turns against it, it but really does. 21 days, smokers, and you're free. <laughs> Freedom. All right, Ephraim. Pat, for the last few days, Operation Blessing Snow Buddies program has been helping snowbound families dig out after the weekend winter storm. I just didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I have to get my husband's medicine. Uh, he's diabetic, and uh, I have to get it by Thursday. The black ice on the roads made it impossible for Suzanne Shelton and her husband Gary to get what they needed for their help. So Operation Blessing made sure they were the first stop in helping people. They stopped in and got them what they needed. It's just really beautiful that, that there's still people that, that care about a lot of, you know, seniors that, that, you know, just can't get out there and do this. So thank you so much. For more information on the Snow Buddy program, you can go to Operation Blessings website. It is ob.org. So nice to see them lending a hand. Pat. Well, I think uh, Bill Horan said it's just a privilege uh, and honor uh, to serve our neighbors right here at home. Uh, it makes a huge difference. I mean, we had black ice all over the place. They couldn't drive. They couldn't move. They couldn't get out. And <clears throat> to have a, a group of eager volunteers 
Uh, that was one of the services that Operation Blessing did for this community and others. I mean, we're there helping people. And so if you want to help Operation Blessing, it's 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com. Isn't that exciting? What I love do? it. I was noticing, you know, what great exercise that would be, too, to get out there and shovel. Oh, yeah, that absolutely. Snow, you know? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I don't think they did it as an exercise. No, but, but, but uh, it's, it's good. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, well coming we'll... up, they had their say on Election Day, and now Christians hope that means someone in Washington will finally be listening. I really believe that God listened to the prayers of the faithful around this country as we reached out one more time and said, you know, give us another chance. Hear what Trump's America could mean for religious freedom. That's next. Well, as Donald Trump prepares to take over as president, many conservative Christians feel like they're coming out of a political dark age. As Trump or is Trump ring, uh, ushering in a resurgence of the religious right? Well, our White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon takes a look at that. For nearly a decade, it seemed like Washington sent conservative Christians to wander in the wilderness. Now they feel a sense of deliverance. The Christians are being treated horribly because we have nobody to represent the Christians. Throughout his campaign, Donald Trump reinforced his promises. Most importantly, I brought my Bible. Okay? And since winning the election, he's appointed one conservative Christian after another to his cabinet. I will be the greatest representative of the Christians that they've had in a long time. And now the vast majority of evangelicals who helped send Trump to the White House are ready to reap their rewards. Those include the appointment of pro-life Supreme Court justices and the banning of late-term abortions. The baby in the womb that has all its vital organs, has, uh, has eyelashes and fingernails, can hear and respond to its mother's voice and feel pain, deserves legal protection as a member of our human family. And he's agreed to sign that into law. As president of Concerned Women for America, an author and fierce advocate for the unborn, Penny Nance says it feels like a new day in Washington. I really believe that God listened to the prayers of the faithful around this country as we reached out one more time and said, you know, give us another chance. There's also an expectation the new president will enforce the constitutional right for Christians to live their faith and obey their conscience. It's an issue that led to a historic turnout on Election Day. I think there's no more important issue at home or abroad than freedom of conscience or religious liberty. Charles Haynes is founder of the Religious Freedom Center of the Museum Institute. In this country, people seem to get the idea that now in the public square, people of faith should be quiet about it, keep it in their homes or their churches or places of worship. But actually, that's uh, absurd. I don't want to equate this to persecution in the United States uh, compared to what's taking place in China or anything like that. But you're seeing people of faith squeezed out. We're, we're finding a hostility in the media. We're finding uh, it's okay to ridicule uh, uh, a Catholic priest or a, a Christian missionary. Uh, they're almost the brunt of a joke. Christians wished it was a joke when the U.S. Civil Rights Commission issued its September report on religious freedom. Commission Chairman Martin Castro wrote, the phrases religious liberty and religious freedom will stand for nothing except hypocrisy so long as they remain code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, or any form of intolerance. This report was appalling to me because it really essentially said when there's a conflict between principles in our public arena, non-discrimination, for example, and religious freedom, guess what? Non-discrimination always wins. Religious freedom never has a voice. We've entered an era, he says, where the claim of religious freedom is perceived as an effort to deny someone else their rights. By using language that suggests that Christians who object or who want accommodation are just by definition bigots um, is very wrong and dangerous. 
It's a frustration that has turned to relief with the new arrival of an advocate in the White House. And Christians happy with Trump are thrilled with his vice president. Former Congressman Frank Wolf served with Mike Pence in the House. And we have probably one of the finest men that I've ever served with as vice president. Mike Pence is honest, ethical, decent, moral man, a great faith. Uh, so the opportunity, and I think President-elect Trump has been very sympathetic. Wolf adds that the church needs to keep the lines of communication open with both the new president and Congress to keep this agenda moving in the right direction. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, it's amazing. Well, Christians said the evangelicals went 82 percent for Trump. They're, they're the biggest uh, block, the voting block. And uh, without question, uh, his uh, presidency was assured because of the votes of these people. But he said something that was, to me, just amazing. He said the, the Johnson Amendment, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, repeal that. And you think, uh, this is the first candidate I have heard in my lifetime talk about repealing the Johnson Amendment. And you say, what was it? Well, we, for decades, have been fighting about that because that was a little clause in the uh, Internal Revenue Code that prohibited uh, the support of candidates for public office. And um, that has been used as a club by the IRS to shut churches up from talking about public affairs. And then <clears throat> the media has taken it and the left has taken it and said, well, it's illegal to talk about uh, supporting a candidate. You have broken, quote, broken the law and on and on and on. Well, uh, it's going to change now if, if that is repealed. And Trump has got it in, the, in his platform and his campaign in his public utterances, and that's one he's got to deliver on. And in my point, that's a whole lot more important than building a wall with Mexico. That is that, and we have a moral wall that will be very, very important. Well, we got an interesting guest coming up. Tell us about yes, it. Yes, we do. Up next, the man who once said sex begins in the kitchen rewrites the book of love. Get Kevin Lehman's advice on how to have a new sex life by Friday when we return. Well, a relationship can be like a, quote, good meal. In order to enjoy it to the fullest, sometimes you need a little zest. Or maybe you think that part of your marriage is long gone. So if you're trying to put some spice back into your life, you've got good news for you. Uh, it can happen again in just one week, according to our next guest. Our friend Kevin Lehman is If your marriage with us. lacks intimacy, Internationally known psychologist and best-selling author Dr. Kevin Lehman says you're not alone. Many men and women feel they're missing out when it comes to what goes on in the bedroom. Dr. Lehman says a good sex life is worth striving for. In his latest book, Have a New Sex Life by Friday, Dr. Lehman reveals secrets on how to develop the warmth, intimacy, and connection with your spouse that you've always wanted. Well, did he lose his baggage, or is this outfit going to be something for getting you a better sex life? Shorts in the <laughs> middle of winter with a snowstorm? Pat, I, I think it was God's will for my bags to be in Charlotte, North Carolina <laughs> this morning. <laughs> is that where they are? They are. God bless them. Yeah. Well, surely somebody could have gotten you some pants, but anyhow, aren't you cold? Well, we thought about that, but we decided, you know, when people see people in an uncomfortable position, yeah. okay, doing national TV in shorts. If you handle it with a little sense of humor, I think people identify with well, that. Well, they do indeed. Well, listen, in the church, uh, is it a little embarrassing to talk about sex? I mean, you know, we we all do it, so what's the story? Well, you know what? I spoke out at Rick Warren's church out yeah. at Saddleback <laughs> and also at uh, Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, a church of 28,000 people. Yeah. And the pastor asked me, he said, Kevin, would you come and talk about sex yeah. in church? And I said, hey, pastor, I've been around the block a few times. What yeah. kind of words would you expect to come out of my mouth on a yeah. Sunday morning or Saturday evening? Uh -huh. And he said, well, words like orgasm. And I said, oh. Oh. Okay, that's what you want. And Pat, you know, they told me at Saddleback that that talk was the most requested talk on tape of any outside speaker they ever had at Saddleback. 
So there's a hunger in the church because we don't talk about this wonderful gift of sex. I mean, I've been married for 49 years in a row. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad to say that, you know, you do change for sure. You slow down. But sex is such a wonderful gift. Why don't we talk about it? So I think God was the original humorist when he came up with this one. <laughs> the two shall become one. That's right. Well, that's God, that's pretty funny because you made us so different. You know, this whole organism thing, uh, I understand that uh, the, the activity in a woman's body is unreal. I mean, there are all kinds of physiological things that go on that, that are, make it extremely pleasurable to prepare her for having babies. Well, and here's the thing. When you think about it, who is more prepared uh, biologically mm -hmm. to really enjoy the gift of sex. Is it men or is it women? Mm -hmm. It's women by far. The sexual response from a woman is huge. But I say in my book, women are like slow cookers, like crock pots. Yeah. You know, men are like microwaves. They can get excited in 1.6 seconds or less. <laughs> and Mr. Happy is ready to rock and roll. But for a woman... It could be 40 minutes before she's vaguely in the mood. So she needs to have this person who loves her as she is. Now, everybody at home, complete this sentence. You're in good hands with Allstate. Yeah. It's been around for years. Yeah. But I think that's how women want to feel that this man, Pat, loves her outside the bedroom. So sex is an all-day affair. Mm -hmm. And it starts early in the morning when you bring your wife a cup of coffee or you're you rub her feet or scratch her back. And I think women look at you and me as men and they say, do you really love me? Do you really care? And if that response is positive, then this woman really wants to please you. So again, mm -hmm. I think God, when he gave us these needs, women love affection. Yeah. They love communication. They love commitment to the family. Well, what, what aren't men great at? Affection. Mm -hmm. We love to grab. Yeah. Never heard a woman say, oh, Dr. Lehman, I love it when my husband grabs me. <laughs> no, they don't like that. They want to be tenderly touched yeah. and talked to. And so I sort of say God was the greatest humorist ever because it's sort of funny because us men, we want to feel needed and wanted. And I always tell women, think of your husband as a four-year-old that shaves. <laughs> he's, he's a simple person. He just wants to know that that he's appreciated for the work he does for the family. Yeah, yeah. And he says, hey, what do you think I'm going out there beating my head against the wall every day for, for you and the kids? That's his love language, so to speak, to his wife. Mm -hmm. So I just asked the question, why isn't sex what it should be in people of faith? And I think we've been instilled that somehow sex is bad or wrong or mm -hmm. filthy or dirty. And nothing could be further from the truth. Every gift well, is a gift from God. You pointed out that men are thinking uh, of sex and their male organ uh, so many times a day. Is that true all the way up and down the line? I mean, or just for young men? You know, I did a study <laughs> yeah. about how many times a man thinks about sex in a given day mm -hmm. as opposed to women. Yeah. Is it twice as much, three times, five times as much, ten times as much, or 33 more times a day, a day. And the answer is 33 more times a day. Come on, men are thinking 33 times more than women about sex yeah, a I day? Share, I shared that with my wife. She said, that's sick. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty old man. Yeah, but yeah. you know, it's, it's sort of how God has made us. Men respond to sight mm -hmm. and a simple jiggle or a wiggle, and that man's ready. But I tell men, like foreplay, for example, uh -huh. foreplay in Kevin Lehman's house. Here it is. Clean the kitchen, wipe off all the countertops, and check this out, Pat. Put the stupid toaster away. Now, why would you put the toaster away when you're going to use it in 24 hours yeah. or less? But my wife, she wants, that's part of foreplay. Now, when I was young, I used to think, you know, take a shower, come out of the shower, do a little dance like you're on Dancing with the Stars, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and as my wife said to me one day, verily, verily, I say unto you, Leamy, that is not a good look. Not a good look. <laughs> so you learn as you grow older that sex outside of the bedroom, the things mm. you do with your wife. And if you say to your wife, honey, can we just pray audibly? Mm. You want to turn your wife on, gentlemen, and you're a person of faith? Pray with your wife. Amen. Because that's the deeper part of your being being exposed. 
So this thing of sex is a wonderful gift. God gave it to us. We misuse it, of course. What about this uh, second childhood and the, um, you know, well, the, the testosterone that uh, diminishes and all the other things that diminish over the years, or is that? Uh, well, it's true. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm on Social Security myself, and <laughs> you, you you do slow down physically and emotionally, and. Uh, we're down to four or five times a week now, Pat, but I'm trying to deal with it as best <laughs> we can. God, you have my profoundest sympathy. <laughs> I, I'll be but, glad to get you some. But seriously, you know, I, I, I think I go back to I think women look at us every day and say, uh, you know, do you really love me? Do you really care? They're always watching us. Mm -hmm. And I think the man who is a good dad, a good father, a good provider, those all are checklists that go off so in a wife's mind. washing the dishes or vacuuming the floor is a way of saying, I love you for the men. It is. It's yeah. a woman's love language for many of them. They mm -hmm. just want to know that you care and that when a man comes home and the first thing he says, honey, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. You know, she says, thank God I married this man mm -hmm. who doesn't see parenthood, for example, as woman's work. Mm -hmm. I always said, if you're there for the launching, you need to be there for the landing as well. Well, what about all the spice stuff, seeing you sex life? You talk about spice up their sex life. What, what, do you, what do they do? Well, you know, people, when they don't have success, they don't talk. Mm -hmm. They shut down. <clears throat> and I think for the woman who's not happy in their sex life, I'd say kidnap your husband. Mm -hmm. Take him on an overnight. People say, well, Lehman, that costs money. I would say go down to Motel 6 and Tom <laughs> Bodette will leave a light on for you. Have a good time there. Yeah. But there's not many men that don't want to have an email at work that says, honey, great news, the kids are at grandma's house. Uh, if you hurry home, I got a treat for you. You're not going to forget. Mm. So anticipation is as good as participation. Sure. And so I wrote this book, Have a New Sex Life by Friday, to try to give people hope for their sex life. And people, by the way, Pat, who pre-order the book uh, at Have a New, Ki uh, Have a New uh, Sex Life by Friday will get a link and they will see that 45-minute talk that I gave oh, it, it, in that it, church it, that yeah. is downright bold. And uh, I hope people will take advantage of it. So if you go to uh, Have a New Sex Life by Friday .com, look for the link. You get it free if you pre-order right. the book. What about men as they reach a certain time? We talk about low T and all that, the testosterone, you know, their, their desire diminishes. They, they, they don't be thinking of sex all the time. Well, you know, um, I always told people there's physical things that take toll on a sex life. Mm -hmm. I'd always say, let your fingers do the walking through the yellow pages okay. because there's so many ways to physically give pleasure to each other as husband and wife. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's the non-sexual things, quite mm -hmm. frankly, okay. that really turn on a couple. And we're reminded in St. Paul was so profound. He says, honor Christ mm -hmm. by being submissive to one another. I talked at Women of Faith, 10,000 yeah. women in the round out in yeah. Las Vegas, Pat. And I stood up there and I said, my topic tonight, ladies, is how to be a submissive woman. <laughs> Well, half if, of them went out of the time. Yeah, yeah. If, if looks would kill, I'm a dead man. Yeah. But I just did that to sort of pull their chain. But the reality is, submissive, even though it's a bad word in our society today, is really a wonderful word that everyone needs to understand. You got to be submissive to God, mm -hmm. and you need to be submissive to this woman you're married to in the sense you got to know what turns her on. Mm -hmm. If you ask my wife, would, would you like a, uh, a, uh, a back rub? She'd say no. Mm -hmm. But if I said, would you like your back scratched? Mm -hmm. She'd say, scratch me, I love it. Yeah. So our job is to figure out this gift from God. Uh -huh. What is she all about? Get behind her eyes and love her fully, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Mel Gibson did a movie, What Women Want. Did you see that? He looks like that. Did you see that? I didn't. Well, he, he had a gift of uh, hearing the uh, unspoken words of the women. So suddenly he became this uh, oh. a success in life. Yeah. Because, you know, you haven't seen oh, That was a great movie. You ought to get a copy of well, it. Well, you know what? The husband <clears throat> who's, yeah. who says to his wife, hey, honey, what do you need me to do? 
Yeah. Or the woman that says, honey, what do you think I should do? I think the smart, I speak to CEO groups all the time, always telling these high powered businessmen, before you make that huge decision, run it by your wife first. Yes. Why? Because women are closer to life than, than Pat and that's, Kevin are. That's right. That's right. They're the geniuses behind the well, scenes. I've learned that. I've been married for 62 years, buddy, so uh, I've, I've learned a few things over the years. I've got 10 great grandchildren and so forth. Um, but uh, the, the secret is, what would you like, dear? <laughs> what will please you, dear? <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think, you know, you, you make love to your wife without ever setting foot in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to say it. If I take my wife out to dinner, what I love to do is go to that restaurant in the afternoon and give little gifts to the waiter. Oh. And I said, I'd like you to bring this out at our, first, at our salad, this at main course, and this at dessert. They're little things. That sometimes they cost under $10. But it's just little ways of saying, you know, honey, I value you for who you are as a person. And if that woman feels that way, Pat, that opens up mm. all of these feelings of wanting to be close and intimate. If not, it shuts down and everybody pays for it. Sure. Kevin, okay, well, that's a great book. I, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, have a new sex life by Friday. We've only got a couple more days. Yeah, and that doesn't mean dump your husband and get a new one or dump your <laughs> wife, by the way. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Making you laugh too much, Pat. Too much. First guest I've had wearing shorts in all the time I've done this <laughs> show. First time. I'm so impressed. All right, Kevin, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Where do you get this book? Anywhere? Anywhere. All you right. get it everywhere. You get it online if New you want. Sex Life, and he'll also give you a copy of the uh, message at Saddleback Church. 45 minutes. Okay. Wendy, uh, I don't know. You're a single lady. Does this help you at all? Well, I'm definitely going to read it because I want to be prepared. <laughs> so, but that was one hot interview. Enjoyed it. All right. Well, coming up later, the heartbreak kid himself, wrestling legend Shawn Michaels, talks about life outside the ring and his film debut. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The European Human Rights Court has ruled Muslim girls must take part in school swimming classes with boys in Switzerland. The court rejected an appeal by the parents who are Turkish born who tried to keep their daughters out of a mixed gender swim class because of their Muslim faith. The judges admitted interference with freedom from religion, but they said the public school has a special role in integration, particularly for children of foreign origin. Earth has once again dodged a bullet from space. An asteroid flew by our planet this week, and it was within just half the distance of the orbit of the moon. The space rock had not been detected until just two days before it came close to Earth on Monday. It was around 36 feet and 111 feet wide. Not huge, but enough to do some serious damage if it hit a heavily populated area like a major city. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It is CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Well, you could call Shawn Michaels a modern day gladiator. His job was to knock out the other guy and put on a show along the way. In fact, he was involved in the match of the year 11 times. Now Shawn has stepped away from the squared circle, but his job of putting on a show for the audience still very much alive. Shawn Michaels emerged in the 1990s as an international wrestling star in the WWE. His legendary skills and rebel persona solidified him as one of the most popular wrestlers of all time. Now a Christian, Sean is open about his faith and stars as Doug in the new film, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. The movie hits theaters January 20th. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Sean Michaels. Hey, Sean, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. I see you 
wore your hats because it's so cold here right now. Uh, well, part of it, I mean, it's sort of like half me, I'm half still Doug in character. <laughs> oh, I got you. Look, I got I, you. I've, I've had a 25-year identity crisis. I have no idea who I am half the time. <laughs> well, so. Kevin Lehman was in shorts, and you've got your, your hat on, so that's oh, yeah. cool. All right, well, you were once one of the, no, the most popular wrestler on the planet. What was life like for Shawn Michaels at that uh, point? Well, I don't know. That might be a stretch moment. <laughs> but but uh, well, I, I will admit, uh, early on, younger, I, I, it's, you, you want it, but I didn't handle it very well. I mean, I really, I really didn't. Um, it was, it's, it, it's, the, it's the phrase, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, yeah. And I, I did not hold up real well. I put a lot of pressure on myself. And then, of course, that caused me to uh, get into a lot of trouble and, what kind uh, of trouble? Well, gosh, I mean, I, I was I was difficult professionally um, mm. uh, to deal with, um, and obviously personally, you know, gosh, you, you know, get into drinking, you get into drugs, you get into womanizing, doing all sorts of stuff again that just really. But you were still able to keep an incredible shape yeah, and do your, well, and do no, your that, job. No, that's, well, that's that's the thing is, you know, you're, you're just because you're good at it doesn't mean it isn't true i mean that right. doesn't mean you have problems so that's one of the things it's pretty easy to convince yourself it's not really a problem because you know you're you know you're you're not you know you're not you know you're not homeless you're not living on the streets you've yeah. still got money in the bank well, you've got you live you in a big house you got nice cars how can you know how can that be a bad thing they called you the heartbreak kid why did you get that nickname well uh that actually uh it was it, it's a buddy of mine uh mr perfect kurt hennig uh it was a it was uh, something that was used in a Chris Ledoux song, and he just said it to me one day, and then all of a sudden, when I went to my singles career and was a bad guy and had a cocky and arrogant attitude, it was just something that sort of yeah. naturally flowed. Okay. Um, and 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 then yeah, just it's one of those things that you say it enough times, it becomes of course a real thing. Well, Sean, what finally broke your heart? Well, uh, it was the combination of of the prayers of my wife uh, that I again. Met her, everything happened very quickly. We got married, uh, then we started a family, and honestly was was holding that little boy um, and realizing that the only way he was gonna um, be able to turn into a decent man was by seeing it in his dad. Sure. Um, and and it still took two years after holding him for that to happen, but it was it was a, a night where I was not in, in great shape, and I could, I could hear him say, Daddy's tired, and that's the day mm -hmm. that it really, um, dawned on me that he's beginning to see it now yeah. um and i cannot i just you know I, I can't i can't raise my baby this way and then eventually uh, you know years later had a daughter but it was it was that moment if there was that realization that, that you know he, i gotta change yeah and and i went into cornerstone church in san antonio and again you know said, i need a bible study or i need something i knew i knew what i was looking for was in that big building um, wow! And so you literally I, went in there uh, oh yeah, on I, your I, own. I, I did. I went in. I went into their office, looking somewhat like this. I think they were worried I was going to rob the place. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I was like, I need a Bible study. And of course, the gentleman, uh, ex you know, invited me. And then uh, it just happened after that. You know, received Christ uh -huh. as Lord and Savior. I bawled like a, a baby. Uh -huh. And the greatest. That's, that's thing when you you know it really oh, yeah. happened. You well, know it really honestly, happened. The best thing mm -hmm. I, I is that. I mean, they, they took care of me. They nurtured me. It wasn't just wow. salvation and see ya. Uh, they discipled me. I, 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 I got into a good group. They, I went to my Bible study. They were constantly with me. They helped me because there was so much going on and so fast. And I didn't really know. I was raised Catholic, so I knew sort of church, sure. so to speak. Yeah. But I mean, my goodness, the first time I walked into a, a you know, a, a Christian church, and doo, 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 I mean, I was like, oh my goodness, what's I going on? I know. Like, I was oh, the same way. And, I, I actually oh felt electricity in the air. I mean, after you've been in dead churches all your life, and then you come into a place like that where everybody's raising their hands, it is a little freaky at first. Yeah, it scared yeah. me at first, and now, of course, you know, all these years later, I'm. I'm, 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 I'm the worst. Yeah, now we're one of them. Well, you are back in the limelight. You've been out of. Um, professional wrestling for how many years? Uh, retired in 2010. Okay, so now you're I still back. go back every now and then, kick you, oh. somebody, yell at somebody, get yelled at, whatever. It's, well, you got to. I mean, sure. it's, it's just fun. Yeah. Um, so you're you're doing a feature film, your very first one. It's called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. I watched it. it was, it's an amazing, I cried so much at the end, but oh, it, it's a great movie. I mean, you laugh and you cry. Now you, you play, tell us about, well, first of all, what is the movie about? 
Well, it's, it's about a former child star, uh, Brett Dalton, uh, from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., just does a, a phenomenal job uh, a as, as Brett Dalton. He, he really is. Like, and I have to say, he was so much help. He was so mm -hmm. awesome to me. I had no, you know, you know I, I was very honest with him, but I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, but he, uh, everybody, Dallas Jenkins, the director, everybody was spectacular. Um, but it, it's about a former, you know, uh, Washed up child star. He gets in trouble again, yeah. and 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 sort of trying to get out of doing what it, you know his service. He's like, oh, I'll do community service. The easiest thing to do is I'll, I can do it in the church. And then while he's in the church, he, he takes it even a step farther. He's trying to get out of even doing his work at the church uh, by pretending to be a Christian, and then uh, sees that they're putting on an Easter pageant, and like, you know, I'll I'll help you guys do that. And, it, it, it's much like Sister Acts. It's, it's somebody that comes from the outside and trying to use the church as a ploy to get by with something, but then the but people you, in you the know, church your, your have an effect is, on Your role is a little bit smaller, but it's an important role. You you play uh, an ex-con who's now a, a born again Christian, yes. and and you're sort of a you know a friend to him, friend to. The yeah, well, and it is. I mean, it, it's uh, it. I play Doug, and and he is. He's a he's a uh, an ex-biker, an ex-con. Did you um, like acting? I, I did. I lo I loved the process. It was fascinating. It, you know, obviously, clearly, I've done some acting before in, in wrestling, but this was very different. Much much more challenging, more intimate. Um, and again, I, I I did. I mean, it was it, it was a great thrill to do, and obviously, we're proud of the film coming out January well, 20th. It's in theaters, and I, and hopefully, folks it. will go out and see it. Absolutely, you got to see the resurrection of Gavin Stone. Uh, where can we see it? When does it come out? It, it opens in theaters January 20th. It's next Friday. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, and it is a, it is it's a, got a pretty decent release and. Uh, uh, being in theaters, I'm very, very excited about it. All very right. Excited. Well, I wish we had more time. It's great to see you. Thanks so much. Nancy, congratulations on your acting debut. You can also hear more from Shawn Michaels today in our exclusive Facebook interview. To watch that, just go to facebook.com slash 700 Club. Shawn, God bless you. Thanks so much for Thank being you, with man. us. Thank you, man. All right, Pat. Thanks, Wendy. Well, coming up, we'll tackle questions from your email. One viewer asks, if someone lies under oath and gets off, is there a, a penalty to pay in the hereafter? Well, that's an interesting question, and we'll do our best to answer it uh, as we have another round of Bring It On. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. All right, we're going to jump right into some bring it on viewer questions. This one from a viewer saying, if someone lies under oath and gets off, is there a penalty to pay in the hereafter, even if they confess to God that they did it? Or do they get off scot-free in heaven too? Well, uh, scot-free for all of us, folks. Uh, if you confess to the Lord and He forgives you, you're forgiven. Uh, you aren't necessarily forgiven for all the temporal problems. I mean, for example, if you kill somebody in premeditated murder, uh, you can ask God to forgive you, and He'll forgive you eternally. But that doesn't mean necessarily you'll get off here, uh, and the courts may have you executed. You know, so that's the way it works. But uh, somebody lies under oath, and you say, well, is there going to be a penalty in the hereafter? No, God doesn't work that way. Okay. All right, Isabel says, are generational curses applicable, applicable when one has been born again? There's a curse on my family because my mom and dad had us before marriage and while my dad was still married to another woman. The first wife cursed us when she confronted my dad about leaving her. I am a sister of four and all of us are not married, no children, and not even dating. Is this all due to a curse? My father's <laughs> first wife spoke over my family? I, I have no idea. I don't know you. I, I don't know if you're attractive for spouses or you don't know what you're doing. But uh, listen, uh, the, Bible, to get Kevin's book. the Bible says a uh, curse causeless does not lie. So somebody tries to curse you, and if it has no uh, you know, uh, substance, uh, it won't uh, lie on you. But at the same time, your father did some bad stuff, and it could be that there's a curse. You need to uh, rebuke that and break it. They, those curses can be broken in the name of Jesus. And so you, you have to speak the word and do it. I, I, I don't know all the circumstances, so I can't uh, tell you specifically, but I would say speak the word of faith in the name of Jesus. All right. Amen. All right. Gianna says, hi, Pat. My dad is a fanatical Christian and suffers from mental illness. He's so controlling and hard to deal with. 
It's either his way or the highway. All he does is pick up my brother and me from school, and he might take out the trash here and there. Other than that, my mom does everything. She says that she would have kicked him out already, but he hasn't had a job in four years, and he's broke. He always uses the Bible to make excuses for himself and demands, demands respect when he doesn't give any to us. What do we do about this? Well, here's the deal. Give weight to your father and mother. She's the only father you got, so that's the way it is. That's the commandment. But at the same time, your father looks like a bum, and the Bible says if any man will not work, let him not eat. And uh, if he won't take care of his own, he's worse than an infidel. So he's not looking after the family. He's shiftless and, and uh, uh, runs around. He, he needs some help. And I think the idea of asking for an intervention is very appropriate. You could ask for a pastor or maybe some elders in the church or something <clears throat> to deal with that man. But uh, if he won't shape up, your mother has perfect grounds to leave him. And, uh, you know, he's, he's nothing but trouble. So God is a God of restoration. And in that case, there's a restoration. So that's what you pray for. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Lamentations. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Well, tomorrow one man bringing joy to the world's unhappiness, unhappiest country. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.